Hey world, Dan Brown here. Welcome to another edition of Tech Deck Deck Tech, an EDH deck building show with an admittedly really stupid gimmick. I'm not even good at this, right? I got this in a freaking Happy Meal, but today we're going to revisit an old favorite. I featured my Chromat builds a couple of times in the past. The first was kind of just janky. The second I made super competitive in a partial Paris environment, but the rules committee changed the way that we mulligan and uh, I had to change Chromat once again, but I, I, I like it better than ever, I think. The last version of Chromat that I featured uh, took full advantage of the Partial Paris. Basically, with the Partial Paris, it was as competitive of an EDH deck as I think you can get. It won uh, the first EDH tournament at Indianapolis's Gen Con in 2015 with me piloting it. Um, but <laughs> uh, without the Partial Paris, it, it's not nearly as successful because not only was it all in combo, right? We were holding on to particular combo pieces, partialing away the rest, but it was also, you know, all in five colors so we were holding on to particular mana fixers partialing away uh, the rest so without the partial Paris it wasn't nearly as good not nearly as consistent and it still had a reputation among my play group as being you know a very very strong deck that people had to gang up on early so uh, I have tabled it for months and only recently revisited it uh, retooled it and feel happy with um, where it is where it is now. This sounds absurd because it is absurd, but the way that I would describe this deck in like a sentence is a mono green with a blue sub theme splashing white, black, and red chromat with Azusa as a hidden commander lands deck. I'm super proud of this deck. I think it is really unique. I think that it's pretty darn strong and it doesn't use combos as its primary win condition. You can trip into some combos combo on accident, but that's not like the idea from the get-go. I will say, you know, no deck has ever finished. Everything is always a work in progress. But at, at this point in my EDH deck building life, um, the last thing I really think about is how we close out games. And, and I'm still kind of getting there with this. I have a few, you know, win conditions shoehorned in. But uh, if you have any ideas as you're watching this as to ways we might close out games more consistently without combos, please let me know. Leave a comment below. Anyway, enough of my yammer. Let me just, let me, let me show you my deck, guys. I mentioned that this is a lands deck, and I'm not kidding. We run 47 of them. These ones are pretty basic. You know, these are just great color fixing in a five color deck. I run um, five of the fetch lands. I would probably run 10 if I had 10, but I just have the new ones that were recently printed. Um, and I run all 10 of the shock lands. Again, I'd probably run duels if I had them or could afford them, but you know, the shock lands, they do the job for the most part. These are boring. They're great cards, but <laughs> not particularly interesting. These are the more interesting lands. I run all 10 of the Ravnica Karoos, as they're called, the lands that tap for two mana, and when they enter the battlefield, uh, bounce another land to their owner's hand, to your hand. So, um, And with those, they synergize very well with um, the Scry lands. I also run all ten Scry lands. So all, already, you maybe are picking up on if we can tutor for Azusa, put Azusa in play, play multiple lands per turn, we can play a Scry land, play a Ravnica bounce land, return the Scry land to our hand, and play it again. Uh, we're just filtering the top of our library with our mana base. That's excellent utility and it costs, you know, no mana other than the downside that these come into play tapped, right? We also um, have a Halimar Depths. It would be an island except this is just extra utility. It's kind of like a uh, scry land when it enters the battlefield tapped. Um, we look at the top three cards of our library and put them back in any order. Basically a Sensei's Divining Top and then we run three more islands and Four more just basic forests. Just a couple more comments about these bounce lands. Um, in all of my Chromat builds, these have been kind of the heart and soul of uh, the decks. Because with Azusa, for example, they make it that much closer to a guarantee that we're always going to hit, you know, all three of our land drops because these, you know, bounce lands back to our hands. They also make mulliganing aggressively more palatable because if one of these is in, you know, uh, say a six card hand, we know that um, if we don't have a turn two play, for example, we're going to bounce our turn one land back to our hand, which basically refills us back to seven, right? Also, there are 10 of them. You know, that's just redundancy, which is good in any magic deck, but hard to find in EDH deck since we're limited to, you know, just one of every non-basic land. And as you'll see in a minute here, uh, we run a bunch of not quite mana dorks, they're untappy dorks, dorks that untap lands. And so if you have a land that taps for two mana or more, that's just like crazy extra value. So half the deck is lands. You just saw the 
first chunk of the second half I want to show you are all cards that pertain to lands, pretty much. This is Amulet of Vigor, just a natural include in a deck that runs, you know, what, uh, 30 lands that want to come into play tapped? Exploration is kind of like, you know, another hidden commander along with Azusa. Burgeoning isn't quite as good as Exploration in this deck because, as you'll see, we're trying to, you know, play very long turns, maybe even take extra turns in a row, so relying on opponent's turns for those extra land drops isn't as good, but Burgeoning still wins games on its own if you play it turn one. It's a fantastic card. Lotus Cobra, you know, for making multiple land drops per turn. This is just, you know, extra mana. Azusa, you already know everything about. Corsair of Crufix. Um, you'll notice as we continue going through this deck that playing with the top card of the library revealed and manipulating what the top card of the library is, is a very consistent theme, right? With the ten scry lands and the Karoos that bounce the scry lands back to our hands and some artifacts and enchantments that you haven't seen yet. Um, and then Oracle of Moldiah, again, you know, top card of the library revealed, play extra lands. It's just, you know, more redundancy for an already uh, very redundant, consistent deck. Next, I have a suite of tutors. Their primary purpose is to you fetch up, make sure we always have access to a way to make multiple land drops, because without an Exploration or an Azusa or an Oracle of Moldiah, we're kind of playing with one hand tied behind our back. But if we already have that um, on board, thoroughly established, feel like it's pretty safe, they can also fetch up other things that we'll, we'll get to in a minute here. I also run lots of untappy dorks. Uh, since we run all ten of the Ravnica Gurus, which tap for you know more than just one mana, these are like twice as valuable, if not more than that, than uh, like a Lanowar Elves would be. Thousand Year Elixir basically gives my untappy dudes haste and allows me to untap one per turn. Um, Crows and Restore, Argothian Elder, Fate Stitcher. I didn't know about Fate Stitcher. Why didn't you guys tell me about Fate Stitcher? Jesus, this card is fantastic for Chrome. It wasn't in the earlier builds. Um, I don't have quite as many of the untappy dorks as the earlier chromat builds that were um, designed to basically combo off with these things. Um, so I, I focused more exclusively on the best of the best of these, the most mana efficient or the ones that just untap the most lands. But um, I do, <laughs> I added an illusionist's bracers. I didn't think about this. This specifically says that it doesn't work for mana abilities, but even though functionally these untappy dorks are, are getting you mana, they're not technically mana abilities, and we can copy them with the Illusionist Bracers, or in a pinch I can, you know, equip this to Chromat, uh, and it's most relevant with Chromat's Boros ability, right? Plus one, plus one until end of turn. This kind of doubles the efficiency there. And if we're untapping lands that tap for more mana than usual, we might as well make them make even more mana than more mana than usual. So we have um, some Enchant lands. We have a Wild Growth, a Fertile Ground, a Verdant Haven, a Dawn's Reflection, and a Mark Festival. They just make our lands that much <laughs> better to strip mine. <laughs> I make that joke, but actually this version of Chromat is a little more conservative than the previous ones, and we don't care as much about strip mine, because even if you get my land that's tapping for four mana with my mana dorks on board, if we still have Azusa and, you know, obviously running 47 lands, we, we probably still have more mana than any other opponent, unless they're, you know, also running an Azusa deck. Next is the blue sub-theme I, I spoke about at the, at the very beginning. These are just ways to refill our hand, maintain card advantage. Windfall is very good in any deck that's making multiple land drops per turn because early in the game we're probably going to run low on cards before opponents do. Um, Frantic Search untaps lands and we run all 10 Ravnica crews so it basically functions as like a, a blue dark ritual except even better because we're also looting twice. See your sundial just makes sense in any sort of Azusa build. Um, Plea for power is either a, a time walk or an ancestral recall for four mana granted but yeah, it's pretty decent. Factor Fiction is just good intellectual offering if we have multiple mana dorks in play, or sorry, the untappy dorks, it just kind of, you know, gets lots of extra value. Time Spiral, same basic logic as Frantic Search, except even better, it untaps six lands and, you know, refills our hand entirely. Um, and but, but, oh, yeah, So these two are, are the primary ways that we want to maintain card advantage, because we have lots of uh, other cards that you're about to see that synergize with these in really novel, creative, and fun ways. Magus of the Future and Future Future Sight, they basically play with the top card of your library revealed, you may play that card as though it was in your hand. So the first and maybe most obvious synergy with, you know, Future Sight and or Magus uh, of the Future is Azusa herself. The most common way that you run out of gas with one of these, right? You cast a spell from the top, cast a spell from the top, and then, oh, there's a land on the top and you already played your land drop and I guess my turn is done. But if you have 
three land drops per turn, Future Sight is like almost three times as good. It gets much better though. Sensei's Divining Top plus Future Sight basically reads pay one colorless mana, draw a card. And you can repeat that as many times as you want because basically what happens, you have both of these in play, you crack the top, you draw a card, you put the top on top of your library, then with Future Sight you can cast the top for one and do it again. Tap it, draw, put this on top, cast it for one again. But wait, there's more. There's also Jeskai Ascendancy. So let's say we have a um, untappy dork, an Argothian Elder in play. You know, we tap this to untap two of our Karoos for four mana, then we cast a non-creature spell off the top of our library with Future Sight, trigger Jeskai Ascendancy, we untap this, we can filter the top of our library even more with Jeskai Ascendancy, and we have four more mana. This is a way to kind of go pseudo-infinite. It's not the same recursive loop necessarily, and you can potentially run out of non-creature spells on the top of your library, but often it's enough to just kind of win the game in pseudo-combo fashion. I'm not done with Future Sight synergies yet though, I don't know what you're thinking. Maybe my favorite one, this is this is insane, is Possibility Storm? This card is a wall of text, but basically whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, triggers Possibility Storm, they exile that spell, then reveal cards from the top of their library until they reveal a card that shares a type with it, right? Sorcery, or instant, or creature, or artifact. Um, and they may cast that one instead without paying its mana cost. But the, the, the the relevant wording here is from your hand. If you're casting a spell from the top of your library with Future Sight, it does not trigger Possibility Storm. So we can be sitting here playing a pretty normal game while our opponents are locked out from, you know, having any real cohesive game plan. Or, alternatively, if we do not like the top card of our library with Future Sight, we can cast a spell from our hand, triggering Possibility Storm, and it basically just kind of randomizes whatever uh, winds up on top next. Also of note here is that Possibility Storm and Jeskai Ascendant uh, synergize pretty well because you get an ascendancy trigger um, twice whenever you cast a spell initially that'll trigger the possibility storm and then the second cast off a of possibility storm also triggers the Jeskai ascendancy so this is another way to kind of guarantee pseudo infinite amounts of mana now the from your hand clause on possibility storm being worked around with future sight also applies to uh, not knowledge pool here <laughs> basically if we have future sight and knowledge pool in play we are not forced to obey knowledge pools, you know, kind of oppressive, quirky rules. And Knowledge Pool synergizes with Possibility Storm. If we control both of these, then we also control the order in which the triggers stack. So we can have our opponents resolve their Possibility Storm triggers first, which renders Knowledge Pool useless to them, because Knowledge Pool also says if they do, and if they've already resolved Possibility Storm, they just can't. Where for us, we can resolve the triggers in the opposite order. We can resolve the knowledge pool trigger first and the possibility storm trigger will still be on the stack and we're basically getting what two three spells for the price of one all of these cards here synergize just in this really bizarre but kind of beautiful way that establishes you know a soft lock on the board that's how we try to win we aren't going for a combo so much anymore as we are just trying to create a board state that's so advantageous to us that eventually we, we can even just power through with a pumped up chromat if need be so the last versions of of Chromat. Oh, I did. That was a kickflip. I just did a kickflip. You see that? Previous Chromat builds um, were trying to take extra turn after extra turn after extra turn until we could just win outright. We're not doing that quite as much, but with Azusa, multiple land drops, and like a future sight, extra turns are still very good for us. So I run just, just three of the you know, most either efficient or just explosive extra turn effects. Um, Time Warp is efficient, five mana. Temporal Mastery can be very efficient, especially if we Mystical Tutor for it. Um, and Time Stretch is explosive. We take two extra turns. So. And finally, I present to you, you cards that don't quite fit into any other category slash shoehorned in win conditions I was talking about at the beginning of this video that I would love some feedback on. Um, the first being Kessig Wolf Run. I mean, if we're making a, a, a metric buttload of mana, this is a very genuine win condition. We can get to 21 commander damage with Chromat pretty quickly. Uh, Cyclonic Rift, this is like the only instant speed answer we run in the entire deck, which is kind of against my rules generally for deck building, but we're all in on the lands front here. Oh, yeah. Staff of Domination, this is one of the ways to like accidentally go infinite if we can somehow make, what is it, like five mana off of, you know, one land with an untappy mana door. Right. Stroke of Genius, I mean, just an X spell. When you have tons of mana, X spells are very good. Bear Umbra is, you know, a way to untap all of our massive number of lands and just equip it to, you know, Chromat or Azusa to protect her. Totem Armor is 
totally relevant. Clever Impersonator, I mean, this doesn't fit into any category ever. It's just whatever is the best card on the battlefield. Uh, Debt to the Deathless, this is a pretty straightforward win condition. All we have to do is get X up to 20. So if we can make 24 mana, which is perfectly reasonable in this build, uh, we can just win the game with this. And then Privileged Position, since we are using a lot of permanents um, that are important. I mean, I'm kind of on the fence about keeping this in, to be honest, because there's no one permanent that once it's destroyed really hoses us, but protecting Azusa alone is worth it. You know, kind of strip mine proofing our lands is worth it. So I, I, I think I'm going to keep this in. Boo, yeah, all right, let us uh, shuffle this up and then goldfish a hand for you guys to kind of see this thing in action. I, I'm, I'll, I'm psyched to show you because that was... Ah. We're all shuffled up. I guess we'll draw our opening hand, see how this goes. One, two, three, four, five. I don't love it because we're a little high on the curve and I don't have ways to make multiple land drops. I do have a way to tutor things up, but no way to right, ramp into this five drop. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See how that does for us. The only thing that gives me pause here is the complete lack of blue mana with our very blue intensive spells here. But we do have three scry lands, so we can dig, dig, dig for that blue, blue, blue and hopefully hit it. So turn one here, we're going to draw. We got a worldly tutor. Okay, that is interesting. I'm gonna take the shock on the temple garden. I'm going to drop an exploration. I'm going to play a second land for turn. It will be a, let's say, temple of abandon. We're going to scry one. We're going to look at the top. It is a possibility storm. Now is not the time for that. And I'm gonna put that on bottom. And then we're going to move on to turn. Two, since we scried one, I don't really want to waste it with an upkeep worldly tutor, and I don't know quite what we'd get, to be honest. We already have exploration, so we don't need Azusa. I think we hold off until we need to use the tutor, and then we're going to just draw a Lotus Cobra. Okay, that's actually very good. That can get us our blue blue pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to tap two, cast the Lotus Cobra, then I'm going to... Hmm, I actually have to... Oh, it makes it kind of weird. If I play both of the lands that are in my hand, then there's no guarantee that I'll have, you know, Lotus Cobra Blue available to drop the Time Warp or the Magus of the Future when it might be most relevant. But I, I think the play I'm going to go for, maybe this is a mistake. You can tell me in the comments. I play our first land drop for turn. I guess we'll float a green, and then we're going to look. As a debt to the deathless, we're going to put that on bottom because that is an end game card. And then we are going to uh, play this again. We're going to scry again. We got to go Gari Rat Farm. Ah. I'm going to leave this on top, which feels a little wasteful since I'm not using the Lotus Cobra mana, but we're, we're on turn two. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. This is going to guarantee the blue blue for a time warp next turn, which will hopefully enable us to do all sorts of degenerate things. Turn three, we will untap. We will draw the Golgari Rot Farm. We will um, float a, let's say, a green there. Then we're going to play the Golgari Rot Farm, bouncing this back to our hand here. We're going to get a Lotus Cobra trigger. We're going to float a blue. Then I'm going to play the Temple of Plenty as my second land drop for turn. We have a trigger here. We're going to scry one. We have a clever impersonator. I think I need to put that on bottom. We're still fishing for our blue source. Then we have a Lotus Cobra trigger. We're going to add another blue to our mana pool. And then for three, four, five, I'm going to go ahead and cast the Time Warp, take an extra turn. And we're still going to count this as turn three, since it, you know, basically is in terms of opponent's turn cycle. Simic Growth Chamber. Excellent news. That is a blue source. And we tap the Temple of Plenty for a white. Then I drop the Simic Growth Chamber trigger. We will return the Temple of Plenty to our hand, trigger on Lotus Cobra. We will float a blue, so we have blue-white floating. Then I'm going to play the Temple of Plenty again, trigger on Lotus Cobra. Let's see, we have blue, white, I guess we'll make a red off of that. Then we're going to scry one. We're going to look, it's a forest, which we actually do need to think about. I think... I want to put it on the bottom because we're ahead in the uh, mana race anyway, and maybe it's time to start thinking of about worldly tutoring for an untappy dork so that we can untap this blue source, right? This now can fetch us up a blue source. So putting that on bottom, then I'm going to tap for green black on top of the other three, and I'll cast a chromat. Let's say let's say burden the hand. Let's um, worldly tutor during an opponent's end step for an untappy 
mana dork. I think that Stone Cedar Hierophant looks pretty good right now. It's either that or uh, Magus of the Candelabra, but I think, I think she's the one to go with. We are going to move on to turn four here. We are going to untap. We are going to draw the Stone Cedar Hierophant, and we are going to, uh, for four mana, drop the Stone Cedar, and that's going to be it for our turn. We're going to leave some mana up and Chromat as kind of a defensive mid rangey creature looking to play the Magus of the Future and have a big turn next turn. Turn five, we are looking for a land, because if we don't get a land, then we don't get the untapped trigger on this, and it just, if we don't get a Lotus Cobra trigger, it's going to be hard to hit three blue without a land regardless. But half of our deck is land, so there's, you know, 50 50 shot we get. Okay, Gassic Wolf Run, good news. We're gonna tap for green blue. We're gonna tap this to untap this. We're going to play a Kessig Wolf Run, trigger on Lotus Cobra, float a blue, trigger on Stone Cedar Hierophant, untap. We're gonna say uh, another green blue plus the blue here is five. Then I'm gonna play the Magus of the Future. We're going to reveal the top card. Oh, it's a frantic search. I, can, I should move this closer so you can <laughs> see it a little better. We have zero cards in our hand right now, so frantic search is literally just gonna, you know, mill to and ramp us, but that, that, that's fine. We're gonna tap the Stone Cedar Hierophant to untap this, tap this for one, two, and then we'll say uh, three like so. We will cast the frantic search and then we will draw two, discard two, so Possibility Storm Forest. It's kind of unfortunate. I don't know how we're gonna get back the Possibility Storm, but then we'll reveal uh, uh, Wild Growth and we will untap three lands, but before we untap, I will float green, black, and we'll go one, two, three, green, and a black. Then I guess for that green mana, I'm going to put a Wild Growth Onto the Simic Growth Chamber, why not? It now taps for three. Um, I'm going to reveal another land, an Overgrown Tomb. That's a beautiful thing. I'm going to play that as my second land for turn. We'll take the Shock, uh, reveal as a state-based action, another land. We will untap the Stone Cedar Hierophant for her trigger. Lotus Cobra will trigger. We will float a blue over here. And this is where we kind of run out of gas because we have a land on top and we've made all of our land drops. So I think the only reasonable thing to do is to say uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, and we're going to pump Chromat, uh, give him plus thirteen plus zero and trample, and we're going to swing at an opponent for. 18 commander damage. And now turn six, this will be the last turn that I actually show you because <laughs> things are already getting out of hand. They, they might well be far out of hand by the time this turn is done, but we're going to draw an Is It Boilerworks for turn, reveal the top card as a state-based action. It's a thousand year elixir, which is just about the best thing we could hope to see up there. We're going to pay, uh, let's say one, two, three this way to cast the Thousand Year Elixir. We're going to reveal a Magus of the Candelabra, which could not have been timed more perfectly. I'm going to pay one green to cast the Magus of the Candelabra, which has haste. We have a war gate on top. Ah, this is getting good. <laughs> for one, two, three, four, we're going to cast a war gate for one. State-based action, we reveal an Illusionist Bracers, but then we're gonna search, <laughs> where is it? A Sensei's Divining Top will come into play. Top's in play, we reveal a land from the top of our library. We are going to tap the Stone Cedar Hierophant to untap the Simic Growth Chamber, then we're going to play our First land drop for turn, a Wooded Foothills. We will reveal an Oracle of Moldiah. We will untap the Stone Cedar Hierophant in uh, the trigger here. We get a Lotus Cobra trigger. We're going to float a green. We're going to say uh, for three more mana, um, I'm going to drop the Oracle of Moldiah. We are going to reveal a Kiora's Follower. That is good news. I'm going to uh, tap the Stone Cedar Hierophant to untap the Simic Growth Chamber. Tap the Simic Growth Chamber for three mana. We're going to leave a green floating here. And we have a Kiora's Follower in play. We're going to reveal a Temple of Malady on top there. Yeah, as my second land for turn, I will play the Temple of Malady. We're going to float another blue off the Lotus Cobra here. Um, trigger here. We're going to untap this state-based action. This is revealed. We have that. We do have another land drop this turn, but I don't think we need that because we have the Is It Boiler work still in our hand. I'm going to put that on bottom for the scry. Reveal a time stretch. <laughs> time stretch. Uh, and we definitely have the mana to cast a time stretch. I'm yeah, yeah. We we're gonna we're, we bait we win the game basically. <laughs> so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Chromat mono green with a blue sub theme 
splashing black, white, and red Azusa Hidden Commander lands. <laughs> Say that 10 times fast. I am excited to play this deck in the next episode of Tandem Tactics, which is a podcast that I've started with some of my friends and I've put uh, links to the side over there to a couple episodes. It should be, should be that way. Yeah, that way. Um, so check them out. Uh, basically, the idea is we play uh, a game of Commander, but we don't record the actual game. We're taking copious notes throughout the game and then we come back after um, and discuss in detail sort of you know, our, our plans at any given moment, what our opponents were thinking. We try to talk it out, figure out lines of play that might have been more optimal, or we just praise our opponents for their brilliant lines of play. I, I think that there's a real vacuum in the EDH media space for um, content talking about uh, strategic insights gleaned from specific games, not just in the abstract. So that's what we're trying to do. So check it out. Let me know what you think. I'll see you very soon. I'll see you very soon. Bye.